Even if you're not an abuser, even if you're not doing this, you have a responsibility to stop it. Tonight, words of advice to stop the legacy of violence. The only way to not be a member of Food Bank in Alberta anymore was to basically self, self evict yourself. Alberta serves up some pretty thin soup for an innovative food bank. We have a very uh, benevolent racism in, in Canada. And a new play about racism is making waves in the Vancouver theatre scene. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The Moosehide campaign celebrated an important milestone today as they handed out their three millionth pin to the Honourable Murray Sinclair. Our Daryl Stranger was there and has this story for us. The Honourable Murray Sinclair had a message for men. Even if you're not an abuser, even if you're not doing this, you have a responsibility to stop it. You have a responsibility to stand up and, and stand between your sisters and whoever might be abusing her. You have to protect those that you love as well. So don't be afraid to do that. Never be afraid to stand up for your sisters and your, your nieces, your daughters, your granddaughters, because they need you. The Indigenous-led Moosehide campaign has been handing out pins since 2011. It was founded to fight violence against women and children. Spokesperson Sage Lassert says the pin sends a critical message in the fight against violence. If you wear this hide, you promise not to harm the women and children in your life, to be personally accountable and mutually accountable to those in your family and your community and across this country. I think it represents so much of the pillars of respect and what it means to practice good medicine. Today's gifting of the three millionth pin to Sinclair is an important milestone, but as he points out, there is more to do. We have only begun to touch the surface when we are at three million. We have a lot of work to do. The presentation was held in Winnipeg in advance of Moosehide Campaign Day on May 12th. Over 300,000 people are registered for that virtual event. People participating in the campaign are also invited to participate in a fast. We are trying to bring awareness to the crisis of uh, gender-based and domestic violence in Canadian society writ large and in particularly the impact on Indigenous women and girls and children in Canadian society by shining this uh, light if you will, into that darkness. Domestic violence, gender-based violence, just like colonialism, requires us not to talk about it and not to confront the facts. And so the first step is, let's confront the reality. And the second step is, let's talk about it and let's start those conversations. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Over to Quebec now, where the Assembly of First Nations Quebec Labrador called a press conference to reveal the next steps and strategies as the provincial government digs in its heels on important Indigenous issues. Here's Lindsay Richardson with more. Heading into the press conference called today by the Chiefs of the Assembly of First Nations Quebec Labrador, we had to wonder, was this about language rights, rejection of First Nations input on child welfare and health reform? Well, it highlighted all of these things and the next steps to be taken if the government continues to stonewall. After two days of discussions, AFNQL chiefs gathered in a united front to announce creation of an Office of Self-Determination in hopes of increasing First Nations capacity to develop laws and action plans adapted to their realities. We've been legislated over, we've been looked at as like underlings or that we're not equal and those times are coming to an end. With several high-profile dossiers stagnating at the Quebec government level and several letters to the Premier gone unanswered, APTN's question about the CAQ's track record with Indigenous affairs and promises of nation-to-nation -nation partnership drew laughter from the Assembly. So to me, uh, the government has not lived up to uh, its own commitment. On the one hand, they say, you know, they, they support this notion of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, and on the other hand, you know, they're acting completely opposed to that very notion. 
They say it's not a move against Quebec or Canada, but a gesture to demonstrate a common desire to see inherent rights of Indigenous peoples respected. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. We always want to hear uh, what you think about anything you've seen here. Here's how to continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at apt10.ca or leave a comment on apt10news.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Judgment over the success of the $8 billion First Nations Clean Drinking Water Settlement is still to be made. But this afternoon, First Nations from Manitoba and Ontario joined Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu to give an update. Haidu said implementation of the settlement agreement is now underway and the claims process is now open. But not all First Nation members who were involved in the original class action lawsuit are happy with the agreement. Roy Munez of Nishkantiga wasn't happy with the restrictions in the settlement. His community has been under a boil water advisory for the past 27 years, but he can only submit a claim for a fraction of that time. 27 years of buy buying boiled water in the store just to accommodate Now, I'm only entitled for uh, four years plus two years, six years max. That is BS. Time for a quick break, but stick around. There's more to come.
Welcome back. The Rock Soup Greenhouse and Food Bank in Wetaskiwin, Alberta has been helping those who cannot afford groceries and essentials. But now they've been expelled from Food Banks, Alberta. AP10's Chris Stewart has the details. Craig Halvidsson opened the Rock Soup Greenhouse and Food Bank in 2020. And in that time, the nonprofit has been giving out food and supplies and last year accommodating dozens of tents on and beside their location for people without homes. Last summer, the tents were relocated to the back lot of a Walmart. But Halvidsson and the Rock Soup still helped where they could. On April 1st, they received a letter from Food Banks Alberta terminating their relationship. The letter reads in part, Rock Soup Food Bank is not satisfied with the assistance the FBA can provide. Rock Soup Food Bank does not agree with the FBA funding. Rock Soup Food Bank does not want to associate with other members of our organization who hold different views on religion, funding models, combating food insecurity. And Rock Soup has been vocal on these issues on multiple platforms, causing discord within the FBA itself. It goes on to say, there are two food banks in your area which you can refer people in need if there is an issue of food stock at Rock Soup Food Bank. Halvison says the increasing number of people using Rock Soup says that the need for his services is still there. He says his first year, the Rock Soup provided 30,000 shopping carts of food and essentials. I would ask the people actually accessing it, would they identify being, you know, receiving meaningful service? I would question that. Um, but I would look at our numbers. Our numbers don't lie. Our, our ability to make food disappear in here doesn't lie. The fact that we need to stock these shelves three times in a seven hour shift doesn't lie. Halvidsson says the funding provided by Food Banks Alberta is less than 5% of his budget. So when you include a 3,000 square foot free grocery store, a free pet food bank, um, we have 6,000 square feet of year round growing dedicated to produce, our aquaponics, a sustainable concept at um, um, the harvest, a return to the harvest. Um, they don't include access models like that. APTN asked him if he thinks his involvement with last year's homeless camps was a factor in being terminated. I couldn't say for sure what it is. I know before we became a member food bank, um, the only way to not be a member food bank in Alberta anymore was to basically self, self evict yourself. Um, so it wasn't until we started as a food bank in 2020, um, 2021, that they implemented these policies where the board could then enact uh, expulsion of a member food bank. And it was about a year and a year and a couple days to when they used that policy. Halvidsson says corporate and personal donations of food and money will be imperative for him to continue. He says losing the food bank name also takes away federal grant opportunities. Food Bank Alberta CEO Ariana Scott refused an on-camera interview, but in a statement to APTN, she wrote in part, after careful consideration from the board of directors, including the fact that food accessibility remains strong in the afflicted area, the board came to the conclusions that it was in the best interest of all parties to part ways at this time. Halvidsson says the Rock Soup will not be going away. We're gonna stay open. The Rock Soup is the story of community, um, you know, and so we're here and we're saying we're hungry and we're calling the community in to help us because that's what we need right now. Um, we can't do this by ourselves. We're, we're stone in water. And so we need people to come in, bring your vegetables, um, help us because we can't do this by ourselves. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Wetaskiwin, Alberta. In Northern British Columbia, the Taltan communities are preserving their language with a dictionary project. Participants shared their, that their language was nearly lost, but now believe they can pass it down to the next generation. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. She got uh, a stick. My, my brain is fried. <laughs> Halton elders laugh while recording words together. Through a language program, the Taltan Central Government is working with fluent speakers on a dictionary project. There are three communities Iskit, Dees Lake, and Telegraph Creek are all participating. They say their language connects their culture and identity as Taltan people. We're renewing our identity. You know, uh, our language is so important. It identifies 
who we are as Taotan people. You know, our language, we just about lost our language, but, you know, uh, we've revived it through our, our, our working group here. Taotan elders in the working group recall almost losing their language in the 1980s when nearly nobody was speaking it in public. Some elders took part in starting a dictionary project in the 1990s. But in this new dictionary project, the group is using video conference technology to connect even through the pandemic. Group members explain they are working on this project for the next generation. One time I was getting ready for work and my grandson was questioning me, my great grandson was asking me, why are you doing that grandma? I said, for you, for you and your kids and everybody else in the younger generation. Yeah, we got the that. Language Conservancy, an organization that works with endangered languages, has provided support to the project. They are known for a method called rapid word collection. Taltan elders and speakers of all levels came together to document the language in collaboration. The dictionary, once completed, can be accessed online by members anywhere. Now they're going to have something that they can access from anywhere to learn their language, to be connected to home, to where they're from. And something that Uncle Pat said to me today was, when I came home, I started learning about who I was. That really hit me hard, and I feel like that's my journey right now, too. Elders also added they are going to speak their language and work with their grandchildren. And I'm going to try to do that with my grandkids from now on, is just teach, teach them how to speak Telta in the home, because I believe it's where it should come from, the home. The Taltan are calling the dictionary a living document, designed to keep their language alive. Participants believe their ancestors are supporting them as they continue their work together as a community. To be able to, to help people learn the language. And um, oh, in my heart, my ancestors are me along the language trail. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. Always great to see these language preservation projects. Time for one more quick break. Coming up, a new play that's pushing boundaries and honoring a lost loved one. Watching this play over and over, I keep seeing little parts of where he was inspired from and like moments in his life.
Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This one from Okotoks, Alberta. Elizabeth Patura with visual confirmation from her first crocus of spring sighting. A sign that the weather is starting to get better, at least in some parts of the country. Thanks for sharing, Elizabeth. Uh, be sure to send your photos to us by email to share at aptn.ca with a chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, plus three in St. John's, six with rain in Halifax, minus one in Kujuac, four below and cloudy in Nain. 13 in Montreal, sunny and four in Shibugamu. 12 under sunny skies in Sault Ste. Marie, sunny and 13 for North Bay. Cloudy and five in Thunder Bay, showers and nine for Sioux Lookout. 11 with rain in God's Lake, sun's out and 11 in Norway House. 12 for Winnipeg, 10 in Dauphin. 14 in Regina, showers and 18 for Saskatoon. Plus one in Uranium City, seven in Buffalo Narrows. In Northern Alberta, plus eight in Fort McMurray and Grand Prairie. Nine in Sunny in Edmonton, cloudy and 13 for Lethbridge. 14 in Vancouver, 12 in Victoria. 12 with showers in Prince George, sun's out in 12 in Smithers. Seven in Old Crow, eight in Whitehorse with rain. Plus three in Yellowknife, six in Norman Wells. Minus eight for Saks Harbor, one below in Pulatuck and Colville Lake. Minus four with snow in Chesterfield, two below in Whale Cove. Minus 14 in Resolute, eight below with snow in Aglulik. Well, it's Thursday and that means it's time for Brett Forrester to tell us what's on tonight's episode of Nation to Nation. Take it away, Brett. Thanks, Winnipeg. On today's Nation to Nation, we'll be talking about man camps, temporary villages that house resource development workers, and how wherever they turn up, Indigenous women are at risk of violence. It's the subject at this week's meeting of the House Status of Women Committee. I'll talk to one advocate about what should be done. Also, the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples is happening right now in New York City. We'll talk to an American reporter who is there covering it about what the top issues are. And NDP MP Charlie Angus has a new book. It's about a mining rush in an Ontario town at the turn of the last century and how it served as a template for future resource extraction. That's coming up in just a few minutes. I'll see you then. Thanks, Brett. Looks good as always. Well, coming up tomorrow night on APTN Investigates, three militarized police actions have taken place on Wet'suwet'en traditional territory since 2014. All three were in support of pipeline mega projects. Tomorrow, Rob Smith looks back at these police actions and finds out why the Wet'suwet'en called them invasions. Here's a preview. supposed to be Canada. My father fought in the Second World War. I know he's rolling over in a grave. Like he didn't go to protect our freedoms and our rights to have it trampled on in this manner. You know when they say they're gonna fight climate change and then they arrest us and criminalize us for doing it. We're non-violent and they come at us like we're the invaders. And you can catch that full story tomorrow night right here 
after the news. White noise is a play that delves into the underlying racism Indigenous people in Canada deal with, and it's creating a buzz in Vancouver. As APTN's Tina House explains, it's a chance to honour the late playwright who wasn't afraid to be bold in showing much of his own reality. Okay, action. Good idea. Just don't slide too hard though, because he's mine. Just kidding. <laughs> See ya! Mwah. Set during a make-believe yeah, Truth boy. and Reconciliation <laughs> Week, White Noise showcases the dynamics between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people and the racist undertones often experienced by Indigenous people. And then the comments come up. What's it like sharing a home with chugs? Anyone get scalped yet? Why would you want to play reconciliation? I I'm so sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Renai Morisot is the director of the play. She says the playwright, Taryn Kootenhayu, who tragically passed away before he could realize his dream of seeing his play come to life on stage, told her he wanted to push boundaries with the play, to create dialogue about racism and use humor to talk about a serious topic. We have a very uh, benevolent racism in, in Canada. And I think that what Taryn uh, Kutanehu has done with his play was to sort of juxtapose the, the idea of, of being, you know, the idea of like what is the white savior uh, to, to being indigenous in the lived experience of being um, on Canadian streets. Shiana Kutanehu is Taryn's sister and also the associate director and sound designer for the play. She says she's so proud of her late brother's work. Watching this play over and over, I keep seeing little parts of where he was inspired from and like moments in his life that actually happened and how he incorporated it into the play. And she is also wearing a sweater with her brother's picture on it. She fondly recalls who he was and all he stood for. So my brother, Taryn, um, was just an amazing human being, like inside and out, just a beautiful person. And he was really caring and loving and he really cared for like indigenous people, you know, for our rights and the land. And he, you know, he was a poet, an actor, a writer, and a skateboarder. And he just um, was so good at all those things. And yeah, I don't know, I just miss him a lot. And he's very, very talented and just gone too soon. White Noise runs till May 1st at the Fire Hall Theater in Vancouver. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. Looks like a great play. Well, that's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and never miss a headline by downloading the APTN News app. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Stick around. Brett is up next with Nation to Nation. Have a great night.